going to get started. Uh, today, as the front slide says, <clears throat> we're going to talk about edge and corner detection. So, just to remind you, uh, what we're doing in the first three weeks of the course are trying to start from the very lowest level description of images that we can think of and try to move our way up to higher and higher level descriptions of image information. And in practice, what that means is that we started out really thinking about the low-level image signal and how it can be thought of as being composed of components that are basically sinusoidal curves. We talked about that. Then we talked about how to remove uh, fluctuations in imaging data that we're referring to as noise. So now we're going to move up a little tiny itty-bitty bit higher on this semantic hierarchy to talk about um, actual structures within images. So uh, noise is not necessarily a structure. It, it doesn't necessarily um, correspond to anything physically real. Edges and corners may actually correspond to actual real things in the actual real world. So um, what do we call edges? Edges are basically sharp changes in image intensity. So quick changes over the course of space from very, very dark to very, very bright, or very, very bright to very, very dark. So if you take a photograph like this, you probably have your own intuitive notion of what an edge is. You could probably take the photograph on the left and maybe place a sheet of something clear on top of it and sketch out what you think are the prominent edges in the image. And they're shown on the right there. <clears throat> we'll talk about this in the next slide, but some of them correspond to the boundaries of the object and some of them don't. But the important thing is that the edges that are present in an image um, in some way uh, make it possible to form a very, very sparse representation of what's in the image. I can take all of the pixels in this photograph, reduce them down to basically black or white, and reduce them down to only a very, very sparse number of pixels that actually have any information in them, and you still get the key idea of what is in the image. So in images, especially black and white images, uh, edges can be used to reduce the amount of data that's present in an image tremendously without really losing much about what is in the image itself. So this is why edges are interesting things to think about. Now let's, uh, let me just restate that not all of what we're calling edges uh, come from the boundaries of objects. So if you imagine a silhouette, there's basically an edge between, let's say it's a silhouette of someone's face, there's basically an edge between the, what's inside the face and what's outside the face. And that's what all the edges are. Well, it turns out that edges can arise from all sorts of different things. So one of them is called a depth discontinuity, which is another way of saying that where an object stops and the background starts, you're going to get an edge. There's also this thing called surface normal discontinuity, which technically is not the boundary um, uh, between the, where the object stops, but where it starts to point in the other direction, away from the camera. So it's a surface normal discontinuity. There's also changes in color that can lead to edges. So if you have black print on a white background, uh, there will be an edge between the letter and the background, even though it's not a physically separate background. They're all part of the same object. And then if you take this uh, photograph with any kind of lighting, there might be a cast shadow. And the shadow itself will, may lead to an edge, even though it's not actually a physical object. It's just uh, an effect of the lighting. So edges can, cause, can be caused by all sorts of different things, but they can be used as, again, a kind of a sparse, very concise descriptor of what's in an image. So the big idea here, um, or there's a couple of them, I guess, is that basically finding edges in images involves a trade-off between detection and localization. So we talked a little bit last time about localization and how isotropic smoothing with a Gaussian filter uh, is useful because it can remove noise, but it also has a drawback, which is that it makes edges less localizable. So I'd like to remind you of the example where you have an edge that goes from perfectly black to perfectly white. And if you smooth that thing with a Gaussian filter, then basically the edge is no longer goes from perfectly black to perfectly white. It goes from black to gray to gray to gray to gray to less gray to less gray to white. 
And that's another way of saying that there is no one single point in space anymore that you can identify as being the boundary between the black region and the white region. It's, it's blurred. So there's a trade-off between being able to detect edges and being able to localize them. And what I'll show you in what follows is that we basically can think of the image signal at, in one, two, or three dimensions. I'll show you the examples in one dimension. But we can think of the image signal as being a function. And what we're going to do to detect edges is differentiate that function and uh, look for certain properties in the derivative. So we differentiate the signal to look for edges, but we also have to smooth this signal to remove spurious edges. So it's very easy to detect edges that are not actually there, that don't actually correspond to real physical objects or to actual events in the image. So to get rid of those, you smooth the image, but then you lose your localizability. So that's kind of the trade-off. One of the neat things that has happened in this field is that this happened maybe, I don't know, 40 years ago or so. People realized that both of these operations can be performed at exactly the same time in one single unified operation uh, through convolution. And I'll show you how that works. Uh, and finally, towards the end, we'll talk about corners. And corners, you all know what a corner is. So in images, in image processing, you think of a corner as being where two different uh, edge directions are present in the same place at the same time. So if there's, a right, if there's a corner that's at a right angle, basically what you're saying is that there's edge in this direction and edge in this direction. So two dominant edge directions, a.k.a. gradient directions. And there's a whole, there's a very common algorithm that has kind of taken over uh, as the industry standard for detecting corners that is based on this principle. That what you're looking for are two uh, distinct, prominent edge directions in the same place. And you're going to call that a corner. Okay, so I mentioned that what we do is we think about the image, imaging data as being like a function. And we want to differentiate that function. Well, the derivative of the image signal basically tells us how sharp an edge is. And, um, if, and, and one of the things we've been talking about already is that it's, it's, it's a useful thing to mathematically think about imaging data as being continuous functions, but in real life, it's actually, everything is actually discrete. You don't have a continuous function that comes off of your camera to sh to, that tells you what the brightness of the pixels are. You actually get a discrete set of pixel intensities at dis discrete locations. So when we uh, apply differentiation in the discrete domain like this, it can be approximated by finite differences, which can be implemented as convolution. And um, in what follows, we'll talk about how that works. OK, so hopefully uh, you have all taken at least a quarter of calculus, and probably one of the first or one of the key things that happened in one of those courses was that, you, was that you talked about taking the derivative of a function. So if you have a function f, and you take the derivative of it, it's defined as this thing, basically how much the function changes over a particular change in the domain, and what the limit of that is as the change in the domain goes towards zero. So it's the limit of uh, infinitesimal change in a function over an infinitesimal change in a domain. Now, uh, let's say that we are in the discrete domain instead. So we want to approximate taking the derivative over a discrete domain. And in particular, let's say we do the very simple thing of simply setting delta x to 1. So. Um, Actually, okay, so one thing you can do actually is in the discrete domain, approximate this, approximate this thing by the thing that's below it, uh, which basically says that you look to your left and you look to your right and you take the difference of those things and divide by 2. And, um, and that's your approximation of the derivative in the discrete domain. So if you look at this formula that's a discrete approximation to the derivative, and remember what our formula for convolution is, you can, actually you can actually replicate this operation by convolving with a filter that looks like this. So, and just to uh, you know, kind of tell you how this works, you basically take this would be f of x plus 1, this would be f of x minus 1, 
So you're going to multiply those things, this minus 1 times uh, the f of x minus 1 to get that negative. You're going to multiply this guy times 1 to get that. And then to normalize these things, I didn't really talk about this last time, but um, what you do when you do convolution is that you normalize the result by the sum of the entries of all the things in your convolutional filter. Or the sum of squares, actually, which in this case is 2. So that's why you divide by 2. So the discrete approximation of differentiation is exactly the same as convolving with this kind of a filter. Alternatively, you can also uh, approximate it in a very slightly different way by instead of taking finite differences in both directions, just taking finite differences in one direction. That's what this is called, taking, uh, approximating the derivative using finite differences. So really what you can do is if you have a one-dimensional image signal like we've talked about previously, you can convolve that thing by this and get an estimate of the image derivative at every pixel. So if you do that, um, then uh, what you can very quickly verify on your own, if you choose to do so, is that uh, this operation very, is, is, is quite susceptible to noise. So in particular, imagine that your F looks like this. There's a big pronounced edge there, but surrounding it is more or less constant image intensities, but they have some noise in them. So they have some fluctuations. And if you recall what we've been talking about thus far is that there's basically contents of imaging data that we're interested in or that are prominent. And there are other aspects of imaging data that we're not so interested in, that are not so prominent. So the little fluctuations between the pixels here, not so prominent, we're not interested in it. This big feature of it we're interested in. And yet, if you take the derivative of that using that finite difference formula, you'll get the result below, where every location plots the derivative of the corresponding location on the top. And what you should be able to see is that if you were trying to use the thing at the bottom to detect where that big edge is on the top, it's going to be hard. Because basically all of the little fluctuations in the, in the pixel values give you a big whopping derivative. And so does the big one. So just using the thing at the bottom makes it very, very difficult to actually be able to tell where that edge is in the top. And that's the name of the game, is to start with imaging data and detect where the edges are in it. That's what we're trying to do right now. So uh, just as a reminder to, to review what we talked about a little bit last time, smoothing makes edge localization more difficult. And again, it's because if you think of that the idealized case, it's that it takes step edges from perfectly black to perfectly white, and it smudges them. And here's another example of that, where we basically uh, smooth this image a little bit and a lot, and then done that differentiation operation. So what you should be, what you should be able to see is that the edge between, for example, the white part of the stripe and the black part of the stripe you kind of get a pretty good idea of where exactly the transition is from black to white. But if I'm telling you that this entire thing is the edge between the black and the white region, then clearly something has been lost there. And that thing that's been lost is called localization. Now, OK, let's talk a little bit about math. And in particular, let's talk about the derivative theorem of convolution. What this tells you is that you can essentially flip the orders of differentiation and convolution and get the same result. So I'll just state what the theorem is, and then we'll talk about why this is a useful thing for detecting edges. Basically, what it tells you is that if you have a function f, such as we have, this would be our imaging data. And we convolve it with some kind of a filter such as a Gaussian filter, like we talked about last time. And then you take the derivative of that thing. That gives you the same result as taking the derivative of the convolutional filter, for example, the derivative of your Gaussian filter, and convolving the image with that. So one thing you might be wondering at this point is that while this sounds like an interesting mathematical oddity, why would you care one way or the other? 
And I'll tell you why. It's because it makes your operation of detecting edges more efficient. This just uh, uh, kind of gives an example of that point where, again, at the top we have our function f, which is that noisy thing with the big edge in it. We convolve that with a Gaussian filter uh, h. That's h dot f, or h star f. And we get the usual thing that I keep repeating, which is that basically the little fluctuations in the imaging data go away, which is very nice. But now instead of having a sharp step between dark and light, we have this kind of eh, gray zone. So then, if you take the derivative of that thing, then, then you lose the problem that you had previously that every single pixel looks like it has a big edge in it. And instead, you have this location where the derivative is at a peak. And so what you would do in practice is, if you were going to do this, first smooth the image, then take the derivative or, sorry, first smooth the image, then take the derivative, what you would end up with is a result that tells you that basically that the edge could be right here, but there's actually a zone that all looks fairly edgy. Now, going back to that convolution theorem, instead, what I can do is start with my original image and then convolve with the derivative of the Gaussian filter. So. You know, in, in case you didn't know what it looks like, this is what happens when you take one of those bell curves and take the derivative of it. It looks like so. It's got a high part and a low part. It, and it almost looks like one cycle of a sine curve, although it's not exactly what that is. And it turns out that if you convolve the image with just this guy, you get the same exact result as if you had smoothed and then differentiated. So this is why the convolution theorem uh, uh, the derivative theorem of convolution, I should say, is a useful thing because what I did here was I had to scan the image with one filter, my, my, uh, my smoothing filter, and do convolution, a bunch of multiplies, multiplies, multiplies across the whole image. Then gone through with a second filter, which was my derivative filter, and do derivative, derivative, derivative everywhere and get my result. Here, I've knocked down the number of operations from two to one. So now I only have to convolve the image with one filter, which is my derivative of Gaussian filter. So that's why the convolution theorem is, or the derivative, sorry, I keep saying that, the derivative theorem of convolution is a useful thing in practice. Any questions about this? Okay. Now, uh, let us take a step as we have done in, uh, at least in the one previous lecture, from one-dimensional images, which are basically like strips of images, like we talked about, uh, to two dimensions. So what happens when you go from one dimension to two dimensions is that there is an additional aspect of edge information that is useful to know. Not only do you have transitions between dark zones and bright zones, but also those transitions have an orientation to them. And here are some examples. You can imagine your edge being a vertical one, which is another way of saying that the sharp transition from dark to bright goes in this direction. Here's a, here is a, what I would call a horizontal edge, where the transition goes in this direction. And similarly, you can imagine, you can conjure up any imaging data, where this transition from dark to bright can be in any arbitrary direction. And this... And so in two dimensions, and also in three, the orientation at which these edges come in could be an interesting thing for you to keep track of. And when it comes to corner detection, it will be. So um, the way you actually detect this orientation of edges is you first do what you would do in one dimension, which is convolve the image with a derivative of Gaussian filter. Now, in two dimensions, there are two derivative of Gaussian filters, one of which detects edges in the x direction, the other one in the y direction. So uh, you only get one point of view because I don't have a, a movie of it, but this is how that derivative of Gaussian looks in two dimensions. You basically have your characteristic go above zero, then go below zero, like one period of a sinusoid function, uh, but it's, in, it's only in one direction, so it, it's kind of going from high to low in that direction, if you will. So you can orient this thing in any direction you want. And what you can do is orient it one way so that the high and low bumps are oriented like this. 
and convolve the image with that, and then orient it 90 degrees off from that and convolve the image again. So that's basically stating what I just said here, which is that you have two derivative of Gaussian filters oriented 90 degrees off from each other. So the edge orientation can be determined by the relative magnitudes of those derivatives. And in particular, one way you can think about this is to take the case of a 45 degree angle uh, edge. So what will happen here is that the response from the two derivative of Gaussian filters will be kind of at medium magnitude. So that tells you that, the, that there is a component of the edge in the x direction and a component of the edge in the y direction. Meanwhile, the x version of the filter will, only, will be the only one to respond to this kind of edge, which you see here. And the y version of the filter is the only one that will respond to this kind of edge, which you see there. So this is another, just another way of saying that it's not just the magnitude or the degree to which a pixel looks edgy that is important, but also the orientation of the edges, which is not that hard to uh, calculate. OK, so um, here is another trick that we can do to detect edges that are in any old orientation using one operation. Now, um, how can we find edges that are at multiple orientations? Well, for one thing, we can, and let's say that, let's say that we um, are no longer interested in what the orientations of the edges are, that we just want to detect them, yes or no, at any, at any orientation that they may appear in. So what we can do is look for edges by finding maxima of this derivative here, which, you know, as a, again, let me just restate that you can do that in one operation. Um, now let's see. <clears throat> the um, maxima of functions are where their derivatives go to zero. And so m maxima of the first derivative of the image or the first derivative of the smooth image are going to be where the second derivative of the smooth image goes to zero. So you can equivalently think of looking for maxima in the first derivative here or finding zero crossings of the second derivative. In other words, places where that second derivative goes to zero. It's exactly the same operation to look for maxima of the first derivative and zero crossings of the second derivative. And this, again, just all falls out of what you've learned in elementary calculus. And just showing an example of that, again, with the same exact input data there, uh, this is what happens when you take the second derivative of your Gaussian bell curve. The first derivative looks kind of like a period of a sine curve. The second derivative kind of looks, it's often called the Mexican hat operator because it kind of looks like a Mexican hat, a sombrero. It's got two positive parts on either side and a big dip in the middle. So what you will find if you convolve the image with this guy is basically the same result that you had earlier, which is that the zero crossings of this thing are where the edge is. Or in other words, the zero crossings of this second derivative here correspond to the maxima of the first derivative. So this, again, all just falls out of calculus. Now, it, one thing that might not be entirely clear is why it would be advantageous to use the second derivative operator versus the first derivative operator. And the reason why is that in two dimensions, the second derivative operator is what's called radially symmetric. There isn't a second derivative in the x direction and second derivative in the y direction. They're the same. So again, what I've told you is that basically there is one first derivative of Gaussian filter for the x direction and a different one that's 90 degrees rotated from that for the y direction. Well, the second derivative of both of those uh, looks like this. It, looks like, it really looks like a sombrero kind of turned upside down. So what that means is that we've again done a little trick to reduce the amount of computation we need to do if the only thing that we're interested in is locating the locations of edges and not their, mag or, and not their orientations. All we need to do is to convolve our image with this second derivative of Gaussian filter. 
and look for zero crossings. Before, what we had to do is convolve with the x direction, first derivative of Gaussian, then convolve with the y direction, first derivative of Gaussian. But now we've reduced those two convolution operations to just one, which is the second derivative of Gaussian filter. And by the way, there's an interesting fact that there's, you can actually get a pretty good approximation of this second derivative of Gaussian operator by taking two Gaussian functions, not the derivatives, but the original function, one that's a little bit fatter than the other one, and taking the difference of them. It's called a difference of Gaussians. Uh, however, usually what you'll find a lot is that instead of people saying we convolved the image with a second derivative of Gaussian function, uh, they'll say we convolved it with the Laplacian of Gaussian. And that comes from the uh, fact that the second derivative of functions uh, operator is it's, it's associated with the mathematician Laplace, and it's all over the place in engineering and mathematics. But it basically just means the second derivative of Gaussian. OK, actually, any, any questions about that before we move on a little bit? OK, so um, in uh, probably the most well-known uh, software tool uh, related to um, edge detection at edges is called the canny edge operator. There might even be a, um, a Photoshop uh, option in there that says detect canny edges. I, I'm pretty sure that there is one in GIMP, but I'm not sure about Photoshop. So canny edges, canny edges, canny edges. They're all over the place. So what canny, and the, the funny thing is that John Canny wrote this up for his master's thesis uh, and actually, his PhD thesis was something even more impressive that most people basically ignored because they were so fixated on his very, very useful edge detector. But at any rate, he, what he wanted to do was basically start from scratch and say, look, I have two criteria. First, I want detection. And secondly, I want localization. That's all I really want from an edge detector. An edge detector. I'm not going to assume that it's a first derivative of Gaussian. I'm not going to assume anything. I just want to start from scratch and develop an, a, a convolution operator that satisfies these two properties simultaneously. So we had a, this kind of really complicated optimization process that kind of wandered through the space of all possible convolutional filters. And for each one, trying to figure out whether it responds to edges and doesn't respond to noise, and also tries to maximize the result of convolution at the exact location of the edge, and basically make the peak that we saw in that first derivative result as sharp as possible. And it turned out, uh, not sure exactly why, but it turned out that the result of this operation was something that looked an awful lot like a first derivative of Gaussian filter. So he used that to justify the idea that for his software tool, what he's going to do is convolve images with first derivative of Gaussians as a first step. So he does the thing that we've been talking about, which is convolution with first derivative of Gaussian filters. Then, and this is basically the reason why his, um, his software or his algorithm went from a useful thing to a ubiquitous thing is that he started with the, this initial idea of convolution with a first derivative of Gaussian filter and then added tricks on top of it. And the tricks are what really make it sing. And one of these tricks is called non-maximum suppression. So imagine that we have an image like that, that I'm not showing you and that you have convolved them with this first derivative of Gaussian filter in the x and y directions and you get the result on the left. Uh, and what you have done furthermore is for each one of your um, pixels, you have defined an, an edge orientation. Again, by comparing the relative magnitudes of the response to the x-oriented first derivative of Gaussian and the y-oriented first derivative of Gaussian. So each one of those will give you an edge orientation like this. So what you can do is basically walk along these directions and determine whether you are the most edgy pixel in that direction. So imagine if you are Q and you know that your edge direction is in this direction, 
what you can do is look to your left and look to your right and kind of look in both directions and determine whether one of your neighbors on either side is a stronger edge pixel than you. And if that's true, then you should probably drop out because you know that the edge that you are a part of is already being represented by somebody who's a stronger edge than you are. That's kind of being represented up here at the top where if your Q, you can tell that the response of those edge detectors filters is stronger at R and weaker at P. So what would happen then is that each pixel would make a decision about whether it's the strongest edge pixel and we're basically remove Q and P from the set of pixels that you're going to call edge pixels. So that helps to sharpen up these edges. Another way to think about that is that you're basically eroding the edges from the eroding the edges from the edges. That's not very clear, but um, there's sort of a the the boundary of these edges is going to get skinnier and skinnier as you remove more and more of these pixels that are kind of edge-like but not the maximum edge. Non-maximum suppression. Also, it's just more known more simply as thinning. Another trick is called hysteresis, which it sounds complicated, but it's not. So uh, what you do for hysteresis is you consider uh, not thinking about each one of your edge pixels as being an isolated entity unto itself, but you think of them as being part of an extended contour of edge pixels. And this, you know, it should be obvious why you do this. I mean, it tends to be the case that objects that you take photographs of are physically contiguous things. You're, you're unlikely to find a boundary between an object and the, and the background at one pixel and not at its adjacent pixels. So you tend not to take pictures of just uh, uh, very small bits of snow, I suppose. So what you start doing is you start to trace out edges where the edge grade, where the uh, edge magnitude or the gradient magnitude is very, very high, like this. And so you decide these are edge pixels, these are edge pixels, these are edge pixels. But then where the gradient magnitude goes low, you might be tempted to say, all right, well, that's where the edge stops. But then if you keep following, you find out, hey, wait a minute, there's actually stronger edge over here. So in that case, if this gap between this very strong edge region and this very strong edge region is small, then you basically fill in in between. And you assume that the reason why the edge magnitude kind of dropped there was for some other reason not having to do with the fact that there's no actual boundary there. Another way to term this is that you're doing edge continuation that you're taking short edges and you're continuing them in directions that you think they go in. So here is your uh, prototypical image. On the top right, you see the, um, the basically the gradient magnitude, which is the sum of squares of the two first derivative of Gaussian results. Um, then if you threshold that simply based on the uh, that gradient magnitude, you'll see what some of the problems are, which is that basically all of the stuff on the top of the hat goes away because the gradient magnitude kind of barely dips below whatever your threshold was. And there's numerous examples in here of edges that kind of really ought to be there, but you have thresholded them out of existence. But then if you do the non-maximum suppression and this continuation thing, you'll notice a couple of things. First of all, at least some of the hat has been filled back in. Uh, this is another one where basically you've started with a short set of edge pixels and it's kind of been continued out. Um, and also you'll notice that all of the edges have gotten thinner too. And that's from that thinning step where you look to your left and you look to your right and you decide whether, whether or not you are the strongest edge, edge pixel on that line. So uh, one, um, one of the key parameters of your canny edge detector and really your convolution with a derivative of Gaussian filter in general is, the, is called scale. So that's usually just used to refer to the... Uh, to the width of your Gaussian that you use to smooth. And again, we'll go back to our, our trade-off that we keep talking about, which is that um, as your Gaussian filter gets wider and wider, you're going to remove more and more noise. You're going to make the image more and more smooth. But in so doing, you're going to make edges less and less localizable. So this shows the results for two different widths of that 
uh, Gaussian filter. And what this does is effectively put constraints on the scale of edges that you can detect. And what I mean is, if you look at these vertical stripes here, the, um, the frequency of those stripes, how frequent they are in space, is, uh, is very fast. They, they change from dark to light very quickly with space. So if you have a very thin uh, Gaussian filter that is removing noise, you're actually going to detect those edges. But if you make your Gaussian filter wider, you're not going to detect them hardly at all. I'm not sure why these three were detected and not the other ones, but never mind that. Um, and just in general, if you look at this image next to this one, you'll notice that there are finer grain details detected on the one on the left, and it's more of the rough gestalt of what's going on is detected on the right. I should mention, by the way, that um, one active area of research nowadays is so-called scale invariant edge detection or scale or detection across scales. And it's trying to find ways around this, what seems like an innate problem, that you have to, that you have to basically pick a set of image scales that you are interested in. So you either have to decide that you're interested in the fine grain stuff or decide that you're interested in the broader picture. And the question is, can you really detect both? OK, so uh, homework one is on the web page, so please start. Um, administrative announcements. Jing, did they give you a uh, office in the CSIF cluster? Uh, one of those TA offices, yeah, they did. OK. So Jing is going to move her office hours from the academic surge room to the CSIF cluster starting on this coming Wednesday. Yeah. So this seems like a better idea because you're probably going to be there. Well, many of you are going to be there to work on the homework anyway. And she can go over to a machine and show you stuff in terms of code and, and so on. Uh, however, if you guys want to come to my office hours, it's in this room in academic surge. And the way you tell that you're in the right place is that the previous occupant of that office was a big Lord of the Rings fan. So there is a, not one poster, but there is an entire collage of Lord of the Rings related uh, photographs that cover almost the entire top of the door, which is great because all the other doors are, are perfectly blank. So that's how you know you're in the right place. There's like a uh, a Liv Tyler area and an Ian McClellan area, and it's really something. It's really something. Okay, are there any questions about administrative type things? Yeah, Sorry. the the microphone, please. Um, are ITK and CMake on the CSF machines? All of them. <laughs> One five, PC one five or five zero. Yeah, yeah, right. But but PC five zero. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just say that in the mic. Um, the ITK, VTK, and CMake are available on all CSIF machines from PC one to PC fifty for you to use. Did you find out about quotas? Ah. OK. So when I taught this course three years ago, there was a problem that, um, that the first homework assignment itself does not take up very much disk space, but it generates such a large amount of disk space that you run out of, that you overflow your quota really quickly. Um, so we will keep investigating that. And, and if it turns out that you still have too small of a quota, I'm assuming that they keep making the quota bigger and bigger. But uh, if not, we're, we're thinking about it. So uh, hopefully this won't cause a problem for you early starters. OK, so let's talk for the last part of the course on uh, corner detection. So what I said in the beginning in the big idea slide is that uh, we can conceptualize corners in an image as being places in the image where two different strong edge directions are represented. 
And what I'm going to do is talk about one particular algorithm for detecting corners that's based on this principle and has more or less uh, swamped all other corner detectors. And so this problem is kind of thought of as solved by the Harris corner detector. So here is the idea. Let's consider three different regions from this photograph. And in particular, what we're going to do is, um, is calculate the first derivative of the image with those first derivative Gaussian filters that are oriented in the x and y direction. And furthermore, what we're going to do is this additional thing of plotting the response to the x-oriented first derivative of Gaussian filter. On the, we're going to plot that on the x-axis versus the response to the y version of the filter on the y-axis. So if you decide to do this thing, what, do you, what is the result? Well, on this completely flat portion of the image, the answer is very, very easy because there's no edge there. Uh, there's, there are no variations in the image intensity. It's perfectly flat. The responses to both filters are effectively zero. So you get a bunch of points. And again, what you're going to do is, is plot one point for the responses of, of those two filters for every point inside this window. That's, going to, that's shown here. So what do we have here instead? Well, we basically have one dominant edge direction um, that goes like this. And so what I've told you already is that when you have a 45 degree angle curve, or 45 degree angle edge, you will find that it has a high response to both the x version of the filter and the y version of the filter. So ideally, if this were a perfect black edge with a perfect white background, what you would find is just a clump of responses right here, where both filters uh, respond a lot, very, very strongly. But it's not perfect. It's a real photograph. So in fact, there are some uh, pixels in here that have kind of a medium response to it. And in fact, there's some pixels over here that are probably not going to respond very much at all. And in fact, the pixels over here are not going to respond very much at all either. So in fact, what you're going to get is this kind of line of pixels of responses that go from high responses to both filters to eh, kind, of fiddle, kind of fizzling off to zero. But the point really is that you should be able to look at this plot and be able to tell that there is one dominant edge direction, which is along this 45 degree angle here. Now, uh, over here, we have two dominant edge directions, that way and that way. And you should see what's coming. You're basically going to get two dominant directions in your plot of the uh, x response and the y response. One of them is oriented along one of the edges, and the other one is oriented along the other one of the edges. So let's see. If we had a tool that allowed us to be able to figure out whether we had zero dominant directions, one dominant direction, and two dominant directions in a two-dimensional plot like this, we could easily differentiate flatly shaded regions from regions that have one edge to regions that have two edge directions. And in fact, we have exactly that. For those of you who have taken, actually, I have taken a linear algebra course. Raise your hand. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so you all know what eigenvalues are. Good. Okay. Uh, so if you have this two-dimensional distribution of data and you take its eigenvalues, you will find no large eigenvalues. If you have this two-dimensional distribution of data and you and you calculate its eigenvalues, you should find one large eigenvalue. And with this case, you should have two large eigenvalues. That's excellent. So all the Keras corner detector does is calculate the, the, these two, this two-dimensional plot at every location in the image and calculate eigenvalues. And if you have two large eigenvalues, you have a corner. That's all it's doing. And if you have one large eigenvalue, you have an edge. And if you have no large eigenvalues, you have a flatly shaded region. And that's just repeating itself here.
no large eigenvalues, one large eigenvalue, two large eigenvalues, and if you are interested in what the orientations of those edges are, you look at the directions of the associated eigenvectors. Yeah? What happens if you have uh, two um, corners inside of the image? Oh, this is a good uh, thought experiment, is that, um, as usual, there's no free lunch. And the Harris corner detector has various failure modes. Uh, I shouldn't say failure modes, but modes in which something other than a corner gives you a strong response to being a corner. And that's one example where if um, you imagine that instead of having your one corner, you have, say, two different corners that are in the same general region. So in fact, instead of having two strong gradient directions, you have three, four, five of them. It'll still, Harris corner detector will still call that a corner because there are two strong orthogonal gradient directions. And in fact, in very, very noisy, I should, so in very, very busy image regions, for, like, for example, a, a block of pixels covering plaid, there are edge directions all over the place. That will look like a corner too. And you think, well, wait a minute, there aren't two strong orthogonal gradient directions. But if all gradient directions appear to be strong, then it'll have two large eigenvalues, right? So it'll still look like a corner, because that's all it's using are these eigenvalues. Any other questions? So yeah, this, and what we have just talked about is this third bullet, which is, well, OK, are there other situations when we can have two large eigenvalues, but the thing that we took a photograph of doesn't look like a corner? And the answer is yes. Yeah? So really, it's saying there is some kind of corner in this region, right? So in order to localize it even more and more, you have to calculate the Harris detector for smaller and smaller regions? Right, right. So in the previous example where you have two Let's say you have two different corners like this that are near each other. Then if you calculate the Harris corner detector over the whole region, it'll look like a corner. But you won't be able to tell that there is just one corner or not. And you have to make the thing smaller and smaller in order to actually have it focus on one corner or the other. And in fact, in the same way that we talked about the scale of edges and the, the, the scale of your canny edge operator picking up different levels of detail in an image, same thing is true of corners. That you can apply this thing over large windows and small windows, and with very wide first derivative Gaussian filters and very narrow ones, and get different corners at different levels of detail. The Harris corner detector is very useful in practice. So um, what we're looking at here are two photographs of the same object in two different orientations. And one thing you might be interested in doing is finding correspondences between these two photographs and then triangulating based on where the cameras were to get the actual three-dimensional shape of that, uh, of that um, cow, I guess. I was going to say giraffe, but then the spots threw me off. So. Uh, here is what happens when you apply the Harris corner detector to both of those. And basically what you do is um, to get one number out of your two eigenvalues is that you uh, take the sum of their squares together and you normalize them somehow. Don't worry about how. So red spots have relatively high responses to that corner detector. Blue spots relatively low. And you can use the same kind of uh, non-maximum suppression or thinning trick to reduce that. Oh, well, first you threshold it to get just the red spots. And then you can do the similar non-maximum suppression trick to reduce big blobs of high responses down to uh, single responses. And if you do that, you get this, where each one of those dots corresponds to a corner in some sense, even though, as we've said, they're not necessarily corners in the usual sense of the word. And hopefully you can see uh, this is a good exercise for you to go over on your off time when you are reviewing these slides at home in the PDF, is to zoom in and evaluate for yourself the degree to which 
there are corresponding locations on this image where you get one of these corners compared to a corresponding location here. And I think that's a pretty good one. So you get one there, and you get one, well, you get two there, really. Uh, similarly, on the legs, you should see similar locations on the legs getting, um, getting corners on the both points of view. So finding correspondences between images is kind of one of the... I've, I, I alluded to the fact that you can use it for reconstructing the 3D shape of a thing. It's also used all over the place. And um, Harris corner detection can be one way of isolating corner E or interesting looking locations in the image for that purpose. Okay, so linking them up in the contours. So um, you can go even further than that hysteresis idea to actually extend contours based on your preconceived idea of how straight they are and how far they should go. That's called contour linking, uh, but we're not really going to get into it. Uh, skip that. So just to summarize, again, to detect edges, you're talking about trading off between smoothing an image and differentiating. In other words, convolving with a Gaussian, convolving with a filter that gives you a derivative. And you have the usual localization versus false detection trade-off. And, and you can do all of that stuff in, in a smaller number of convolutional operations in practice if you use that derivative theorem of convolution. And to detect corners, you simply look for regions that have more than one dominant gradient direction. Any last minute questions? Okay. Uh, discussion is next.